Everyone loves a good internet meme, especially the ones about the person with the never-ending project on jack stands. And it's all fun and games until you realize you're that person. The ECU for this project has been by far the biggest hold up. A local Mustang shop, JPC Racing, turned me on to this FuelTech FT600. This is the ECU and screen combo in one. Compact, very, very nice construction, very cost effective compared to some of the other options out there on the market for the Viper platform. There is also this very cool 3D printed mount for it that is specifically designed for the 240SX. We're not going to use this just yet. We're going to go ahead and put the FT600 in so we have access to the wiring and everything in case we have to do any troubleshooting. Solid. Now we're still working through some of the wiring, but we were lucky that there is a boom slang adapter harness that is specifically designed for the Viper engine to the FT600. Hopefully that's going to help us with the majority of the wiring. There we go. We are cooking with gas now. I am still waiting for the base map from Fuel Tech for the first startup. In the meantime, we have a couple other little things that we can go ahead and check off the list. I have been massively excited about these awesome catch cans from Improve Racing ever since I got my hands on them. This is by far the coolest part of the design for me, though. It has this quick release collar that keeps everything in place. Once you remove that, you can go ahead and open the catch can up to dump out the excess oil if you decide not to use the drain on the bottom. But you get a good look at what the inside of this looks like, the design that went into this to direct the air to optimize the airflow all you do to put it back together clip it back into place put your lock ring back in with a half inch overhang on both sides Very happy with how all the line routing came out. This is by far my favorite part, getting rid of those blue ugly adapters that were on this engine previously. It's all plumbed nicely back into the intake for the best flow that we can possibly get on this. Now, one other question mark here in the engine bay is figuring out what we're gonna do with the throttle cable. We don't need to do this to start it, but we are gonna need to take care of this if we want to drive it. This is the factory 240SX throttle cable, and you can see it's a different type of clip that has to go on the end of it. Luckily, amongst the the Mopar graveyard back here. Carrington has exactly what I need. The truck is going to be running an electric throttle body, so it's not going to have a use for this manual cable anymore, which means I'm taking it. After all that talk and the constant Mopar jokes about credit score and the rust all over the floor and everything he's went on about, now look who needs something. Imagine that. This does feel like a new low for me. Tim and I are working through a couple scenarios here, but ultimately this clip is what we need to slide into place on to there. Now, the trouble is that we have to figure out a way to attach this with this clip to this cable in a secure method. This is taken back to the upholstery days. We actually used to use the same type of braided line for the perimeters of racing seats. So a lot of bucket seats use this around the outermost edge of the upholstery, and then you use a spray ring and a loop design on the bottom to go ahead and make the connection this one i've actually looped both ends and i've already crimped it and this is basically designed to do exactly what we need it to do the only question is if we even need that dodge cable because we might be able to make this work as it is right now now we are really only going to get one shot at this because the cable is an appropriate length as it is we know for sure that that needs to come off though good catch that didn't work Nope. No Randy Moss here. 
So the only question that we have is if this wire is too thick. I have these in one size based on what we used to do, and this is definitely a little bit thicker. All right, well, our plan has evolved slightly, and I think we are actually gonna use this based on the length of the cable. If we tried to loop this cable, it's gonna be way short, but we can do this crimp on the end of it and get it through one single time, crimp it shut, and then it's gonna look a lot like the Dodge cable that we just cut the end off of. All right, moment of truth here. Uh, that crimped down real good. I think that might hold. Now, I do think there is only one way to properly test this. This is how to force it get dry, right? Give it more throttle. <laughs> Boom! Car panel destroy it. <laughs> is it Fernando approved? Tim. 10 of the 10. All right, base map is acquired. It is time to figure out how to upload it. All right. Oh my. Do we have a map on there? Yeah, yeah it took that it. Was, that was fast. Real fast. Input number three. Um, that's going to be oil pressure. Oil pressure. We're loading the map for the first time and trying to get some of the input set up. And I'm having trouble with the throttle position sensor. It's wide open. Yeah, it's changing. Okay, cool. Okay. So that, that seems to be taken care of. All right, so having Cody get into this remotely, we are good to go on the TPS. It is calibrated, but we are physically having a fuel issue. We literally have no flow, and we're showing some issues over here. So we got a couple things to work through before we get to try and fire this first time. So our first problem is a simple one to solve, but that doesn't make it any more stupid on my part. The fuel actually had pressure. The problem was it was backing up at the regulator here because this is the return line and that is where the fuel was feeding from. So we had no pressure here at the rails because it wasn't making its way there because the fuel is not supposed to flow this way. It's supposed to flow this way but luckily it's a quick easy fix at the back end of the car here we can just switch the lines and that will go ahead and take care of our problem another small mistake on the fueling system i'm going to let tim explain this one though the fuel pump control relay needs to be triggered via a 12 volt power source the problem is that the input that it was on was giving a ground trigger so we're going to move the pin to pin number 26 which is a 12 volt trigger and that should solve that problem. But All right, so with everything powered up now, we should be able to trigger the fuel pump. Contact. Yes! Success. Now we do not have fuel pump anymore on our list of red little triangles, but the problem is every single one of the fuel injectors appears not to have continuity. So luckily the nice folks at Boomslang sent me over a wiring schematic. They sent me everything that they had, but this is for the fuel injectors. It's probably gonna be a little bit hard to see and I'm probably gonna lose focus, but it looks like brown white is actually what feeds power. So we have located the brown white wire, which ultimately will be hooked up to a relay, but for our purposes. Yep, we know we have our wire. And that beep tells us that we have continuity and that is indeed the wire that we need to be feeding power with yet another very temporary jumper wire it looks like our injector issue is fixed and i think that is the last thing we need to do to fire this thing up are we ready we're as ready as we're ever going to be spray it contact spray it contact And we're dropping out ignition on cylinder six and seven. But more importantly, no cam sync. All we did was unplug this and plug it back in, and then he pulled it up again, and it read. That's a good normal. point, yeah. 
So maybe another situation where it's just not reading because it's not in contact with the pins and my little bitch fingers can't unclip the connector. So you want to try that? Just unplug it and plug it back in? Next. It's like an old Nintendo console. Just blow into it. No cam sensor. It's still not sinking? Mm -hmm. It is getting a little bit late, and I think that we are going to need to call the Fuel Tech helpline again. So I think we're going to have to pick this up in the morning. So the first thing that we dove into this morning was verifying that we had a connection for all of our wires going to our camshaft position sensor. We have continuity from there over to the clip, and then the wiring diagram for the boom slang matches up with everything so we went ahead and pulled out the camshaft position sensor itself this was a running engine when we removed it but when you look at this it looks like the reluctant ring is making slight contact with the camshaft position sensor now i think it's an absolutely horrid design but this is slotted so it can slide in and out so it looks like at some point it just got moved a little bit further in and we don't know if this sensor is actually good they seem to be relatively hard to come by, so we're gonna try and change the spacing on this and see if we can get a signal. Hey Cody, what's up man? It's Austin with that uh, Viper Swap 240SX I was talking with you yesterday. When we crank it, it's showing RPM on both of them. So we're wondering if maybe there's some calibration type issue between them. There we go. Oh, there it goes, okay, cool. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, we are, we are making headway here. Now, have you gone through and clicked these and to see if you can hear the uh, injectors firing? We have not, no. I can I can do that now if, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Now we are flooded with fuel. Our fuel pressure dropped down to one. Oh, like it actually opened yeah, them up yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually just put fuel in there. <laughs> I was not ready for that. We got a couple more changes to make, but obviously we're getting pretty close here. switch that's that's yeah that, that's you know swap stuff don't worry about that guys this has been an incredibly long time coming we're gonna fire it up once or twice more just because we want to hear from all the angles and then obviously we have a lot that we need to button up and make more permanent before this thing can have its appointment on the dyno and we also need to get something to make sure it can stop because it has no brakes right now from what i've seen there's nothing that would prevent you from doing a burnout right now right it's just a quick one in the shop. There's, there's, there's nothing hanging on the ground. I mean, you can pick those wires, you can tie those wires up. We can wheel chop the front wheels. Leave it to Lee to put me on the spot for doing a burnout when it started for the first time ever 20 seconds ago. Uh, I have no idea what it just did with the steering wheel. It's got the yellow stitching at 12 o'clock. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> so what we think happened is that those lines were backwards. They were on the rack when we got the rack. I, I don't know if they ever got taken off, but that might explain why we have something weird going on with those wheels. Shaky steering wheel. Look 
at that setup on there. We got a lot of header wrap that is breaking in, but boys, we are running. Good oil pressure, fuel pressure looks to be pretty good too. We are, we are making moves here. For the brakes on the 240SX, I picked up a Willwood front brake kit. These are 13 inch rotors and should help a little bit slowing down the extra weight that we have at the front end of the car. Off camera, I went ahead and took care of a little bit of the tedious tasks like safety wiring the brakes and getting the calipers themselves ready to mount on the car, which we will go ahead and do once Tim wraps up the little bit of wiring that he has going on and we can get the front wheels off. In the meantime, we have some stuff to take care of on the top end, which is going to start with this dual master cylinder brake booster delete kit that I picked up from the guys over at MA Motorsports. There's absolutely a ton of parts to this setup, but for someone looking for the ultimate in versatility, this can basically be mix and match between master cylinder sizing and bias to pretty much be set up for any sort of combination. You can see there are some shims that have different offsets on them that give you different pedal ratios. We're going to go ahead and do the one that is right in the middle, which should be just about six to one pedal ratio. Just to keep things simple, if we really start pushing this car, we might have to change that. But for getting it on the road, I think that will be the trick. Our master cylinders then thread into the bias bar here and we can go ahead and put this in the car and start our adjustments. Easy enough, all this mounts up. Our clearances are very tight, but it looks like everything is gonna function properly. Again, this should be just a very kind of neutral setup for us to get going. And then if we end up drifting this car or racing this car and we need to be focused on some aggressive stops, then we can fine tune it from there. I do wish that I would have powder coated this bracket black while I had it out, but we'll just say that the gold matches the gold of our wheels. Although I'm not quite sure that our brakes are actually gonna fit behind them, but we're gonna find out right now. Part of the kit for the 240SX includes this little collar, which gives you a nice tight fit onto the bolt and takes up the extra slack that is in the spindle here. Basically, we just need to press it into the spindle itself. Now that I'm nicely covered in anti-seize, that's done. And then our rotor, which it helps to line up properly. And then our caliper. Lineman looks great. I guess it's time to see if that wheel actually fits over it. Not bad at all. Looks all clear, nothing rubbing.
Oh, she actually broke loose. No way. Much better. Much better. Yes, we torque wheels around here. Another problem that we noticed on the test drive is that we are not seemingly getting any charge out of the alternator. After doing some quick diagnostic with the wiring, we realized that the alternator wiring didn't actually go over to the pin that it's supposed to go to. The two wires that come from it were actually terminated in this harness just to nothing. So after some quick tests, we called the guys from Fuel Tech to figure out the ECU side of things. And once we had the proper wires connected, we were finally able to get this thing powered properly from the ECU. So now it's actually putting out power and charging the system. Lee's driving. Oh, are you worried about Lee driving this thing? I told him to take it easy. <laughs>
minor adjustments. The clutch is the most annoying part. They're yelling at us. <laughs> well, Somebody const appreciates it. Construction that. workers love dump truck engines like this. <laughs> the sound is awesome though. It sounds so good. Nothing like a Viper. The cam makes it sound a lot nicer than a stock car, for sure. It does. Alright, I gotta give it a solid B+. It is... It's a solid driving car already, and it has no business being a solid driving car this early into the spot. Once it's actually figured out, I think this thing's gonna be really fun. Really, really fun. We have to know that I rated it a B+. A B+. Wow! You must be in a good mood today. Yeah, I mean, the clutch sucks. The brakes suck. There's a lot that sucks about it, but it's nice. What do you think, Eric? It's not as bad as I thought. Okay. Uh, it has a lot of torque and it's not tuned, so I'm very excited to see it like actually running. The I said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty awesome. Guys, we still have a ton of work to do on this car. We got a couple noises. We got a couple leaks that we got to figure out. But it's running. It's driving. It's been a extremely long path to get to this point. But we're finally getting somewhere with this car. A couple sponsors to thank real quick. Improved Racing, Fuel Tech, CSF. These guys have been on board with this project from the beginning. Couldn't have done it without them. And in the next video, we're going to get this thing worked out. We're going to get it on the dyno. And we're going to get it all sorted. So...